Uh, we're going to spend the next 40 days learning and learning to love God's word in lots of different ways. I just want to start by saying um, what we're going to be doing on the next six Sundays. In your small groups, you're going to be spending time looking at how we can understand God's word devotionally and how we can share together and understand it in our own homes and sharing in small groups, understanding how to um, interpret God's word. On our Sundays, we're going to do something a little bit different and we're going to look at some questions about the Bible. This morning, we're going to look at the inspiration of the Bible. Can we trust it? How can we trust the Bible? It's a valid question, isn't it? You might not ask that question, but people around you might ask that question. You say you live by the Bible. Well, how can you trust that? We're going to look at that this morning. Next week, we're going to look at the foundation of the Bible. What is the purpose of the Bible next Sunday? After that, we're going to look at the illumination of the Bible. How does God illuminate our minds? How does he help us to understand what he is saying and wants to say to each one of us and as a community? Week four, we're going to look at interpretation. How do I know what this verse means as I read it? How do I interpret it? Some of it was written a long time ago. How do I interpret it for me today? How do we do that? Week five, we're going to look at integration of the Bible. How do I put the Bible into every area of my life? How do I integrate it into life generally? And then the last one, we're going to look at application. We're going to do that every time. <laughs> But on the sixth week, we're going to ask, look at how do I apply it to specific things in my life, like making decisions. How do I use the Bible in making good decisions? And that's six weeks. And then we're going to be done. It's going to be very exciting, I think. I'm not going to do all the preaching. We're going to share it around. John Glover's going to uh, teach at Reflections next week. Uh, Jez is going to use it in the, the all-age service next week. Uh, our young people and our children are also using this series and Fiona and John have adapted some of the materials so that they can be all part of it. I think there's some great power in as a church being unified together and doing something together. I think there's great power in that so God can speak to all of us and we can share what he's saying to each one of us. So we're going to do that from the youngest to the oldest. Can I encourage you to be part of a small group as well? Uh, speak to me, speak to Joe Pamphlon. You can still sign up. There are some new small groups as well as existing small groups. We're all going to be looking at God's word and this series over the next 40 days. Jesus ended the Sermon on the Mount, one of the longest bits of his teaching, with a story. He told a story about two men who built houses on two different foundations, one on rock, one on sand. I'm sure you know the story uh, very well. One went and built his house on the sand, and as the storm came, as the floods came, that house collapsed. The house on the rock, the solid foundation, stood fast and firm and didn't collapse. Jesus says, after saying and telling them this story, he says in Matthew 7, verse 24, this, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the wise man who built his house on the rock. Well, I don't know what 2016 is going to hold for you. Maybe it's already started in a difficult way for some. There's going to be storms of life in 2016 for many of us, if not all of us. Emotional storms, health storms, financial storms. If you're built on a solid rock, if you've got a firm foundation... We're going to be more easily and more readily prepared to withstand those storms so that our life doesn't crumble. We can build our lives on the opinion of other people. We can build our lives on popular opinion. We can build our lives on what our culture tells us we should be doing and living. But we need to build our lives on unchanging truth that is a solid foundation. The Word of God needs to be at the foundation of our life. We might hear it on a Sunday. We might read it every day. We might get in our small groups together. Doing all that together will give us a firm foundation for our life. And it's great that over these next 40 days we're going to be doing that and saying how can we make the word of God the foundation for our life. So, 
Today, we're going to ask this question. How can I trust the Bible as a firm foundation? Is it a firm foundation? Or are we going to find one day that a sinkhole suddenly appears? They seem to be in the news lately, don't they? A sinkhole suddenly appearing all over the place. Um, Or when the storms come, that our foundation collapses. How do we know that the Bible is a firm foundation that we can trust it? Well, we read in 2 Timothy chapter 3 earlier on uh, this scripture. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. We're going to look at the second half of that verse uh, later on in the series. But that first bit, all scripture is God-breathed, what does that mean? All scripture is God breathed. I used to think that meant um, that as people wrote down the words, they were in a sort of trance in some way. And that that's what it was saying, that all scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching and rebuking. But if you think about it for a minute, how are you hearing me speaking to you today? You're hearing me speak because my breath is coming up over my vocal cords. And as it comes up over my vocal cords, you hear the words that I'm speaking to you, I hope. So my words are my breath. And that's what this scripture is saying. All scripture is God-breathed. It's God's word to us as he breathes and as he speaks. And he's always spoken, even from the beginning of time and the beginning of creation. Creation came about, the Bible tells us, because God spoke and light came about. All scripture is God's breath. It is God's word to us. And that's the core of the claim that the Bible says about itself. The Bible isn't just like any other book. It is God speaking to us. Not just a bunch of fables, a bunch of stories, but God's word to us. But that's a bit of a circular argument, isn't it? I can trust God's word because God's word tells us that I can trust it. Surely we need something a little bit more than that. It seems to be a legitimate, valid question to say, well, surely that's not enough. Surely we need something else. So this morning, we're going to have a seven-point sermon. I told you I don't like three-point sermons, so we've got seven-point sermon. These are the seven points we're going to go through uh, one by one uh, this morning. The first one is it's historically accurate. The Bible is historically accurate. It's doctrinally correct, yes. It's morally correct, yes. It's theologically correct, yes. But it's also historically accurate. This verse in Hebrews 6, verse 18, it's impossible for God to lie because God is truth. The only reason the universe works is that God has put it in place and he's put laws in place that actually work. It would be a bit weird if the law of gravity only worked on a Tuesday and a Thursday, wouldn't it? Think about that one. Um, Not for too long. Psalm 33, verse 4, says this, The word of the Lord is right and true. That's not only true and right about salvation, but it's also true and right about history. How how do we know the Bible is historically accurate? Well, what are the questions that a historian would ask of anything he was reading? Well, the first thing he would ask, wouldn't he, is this an eyewitness account of what's happened? Or is this something that someone's handed on to somebody else who's handed it on to somebody else or somebody else? Is this an eyewitness account? And that's what the Bible is. Good history is eyewitness accounts of the people who were there telling us actually what happened. What was their experience? What did they see? What did they hear? Not legends written and handed down over hundreds of years. So the Bible is good history because it is eyewitness accounts. Moses was there when the Red Sea split. Joshua was there when Jericho fell. The disciples were there. They sat and they ate and they lived with Jesus. They sat in an upper room when the resurrected Jesus came and visited them through locked doors 
and solid walls. They were there, they saw it, they experienced it, and they tell us what their experience was. Imagine there was a car crash outside Victoria this morning as we left, and we asked, what, were, what did you see? What happened? We'd probably get, I would imagine, various versions of what they saw. Maybe one person focusing on the car that came careering down the road, another one focusing on maybe a child that ran out in front of a car. People would focus on different things, but they would give us a picture that was accurate in terms of what happened. Because as we see and experience things, we see and experience things differently, but we still give an accurate portrayal of what we saw and what we experienced. Similarly, in the Gospels, where we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John giving us what they experienced, what they saw, what their perspective, what their emphasis was on the experiences that they had, they still give us an accurate perspective because they were there. They were eyewitnesses. And that's the first test of historical accuracy. Eyewitnesses tell us what they saw and what they experienced. The second test is, well, okay, how accurate then were the accounts as they were passed down? Have you ever heard anyone say, well, okay, maybe the accounts were right when they were first written, but then they've been passed down and down and down and down over hundreds, even thousands of years, and maybe they're not as accurate. Well, someone who says that hasn't really looked into the rules and regulations that those who had to write these things down lived under. For instance, the Old Testament copyists, the scribes who wrote these things down, they had a whole set of rules and regulations to make sure things were accurate. So, for instance, rather than copying words, they copied letters. And as they copied the letter to form the words, to form the paragraphs, to form the pages, <clears throat> they were tested by, at the end of it, counting the number of A's, for instance, in the document. <laughs> and if there was one out, it was ripped up, thrown in the bin, and they started all over again. It shows that things were copied accurately, <laughs> counted, and we, so we now have copies that are accurate of documents that were handed down over hundreds of years. You may have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. That little image at the bottom of this uh, slide is an image from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Documents that were found uh, in the last century. Before the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, the earliest documents that we had of some of these Old Testament books specifically were thousands of years old. The, old, the Dead Sea Scrolls gave us new copies of things that were much earlier than the ones that we had. And so we could check, okay, well, these are much earlier. Are the ones that were much earlier the same as the ones that we've got now that were much later? And they found that there was only a 5% difference between documents that were thousands of years in age difference. And that 5% difference were largely things like spelling errors in the names of people or the names of places. All the other stuff was accurate because it was copied again and again and again accurately for us. The other reason we know it's historically accurate is because of archaeology. The places that we read about in the Bible that Paul stood and preached at, they've been dug up by people. They've been dug up and found that actually these places existed. When scholars at some times were saying, well, it only ever happens in the Bible, we, we don't have any other evidence that these places existed, so surely the Bible isn't accurate. For instance, the Hittite Empire was an empire that was only ever written about in the Bible until the last century when a professor in the 1900s dug up 10,000 clay tablets at the capital of the Hittites that the Bible talked about. And so scholars said, ah, right then, we got it wrong. The Bible is accurate. The Hittites do exist. So the Bible's historically accurate. That's the first thing we want to say. Why? because it was eyewitness accounts, because it was written down accurately, and because we can prove it through archaeology. Second point, how are we doing? Five minutes left, let's see. <laughs> the 
The Bible's scientifically accurate. Again, people will say, well, that's not the case, is it? I mean, the Bible isn't science. You wouldn't go and build a rocket, would you, based on the Bible? Well, that's not what the Bible was written for. It wasn't written in scientific language as such. But the Bible never gives us bad science. Um, I like this quote, um, if you can read it. Science is simply thinking God's thoughts after him. I like that quote. Famous astronomer. Uh, from a previous century. In other words, God has established the laws of physics. He's established the scientific laws and scientists are discovering what he's put in place in the first place. Truth never changes, science does. There was a news item, you might have seen it this week, um, about a um, sculpture park in Crystal Palace. They're trying to raise several million pounds to preserve this sculpture park of dinosaurs that was built in the 1850s, the curator said. And the news, uh, the news reporter said, well, it was built in the 1850s. These, these images of dinosaurs from the 1850s, so are they still accurate? And the curator just laughed and said, you've got to be joking. That was the 1850s. None of these dinosaurs now, what we know about dinosaurs, look like the ones that we are, we've got here in this park. But we still want several million pounds to preserve... <laughs> what science was saying in the 1850s. The school books that you used are probably pretty obsolete now, I would imagine, because science moves on. But the Bible's truth remains, so that as science discovers new things, it discovers what God set in place in the first place. The Bible is scientifically accurate. How do you know the Bible is prophetically accurate is my next point. Historically accurate, scientifically accurate, prophetically accurate. Well, the Bible has literally got thousands of prophecies telling us about things that happened at the time, happened in the future, and are still to happen. Lots of predictions, hundreds of predictions about Jesus, who he was, when he was going to be born, what would happen to this Messiah. Even predictions about crucifixion before the Romans were crucifying people. When David wrote Psalm 22, which talks about the crucifixion, it wasn't happening. Such things didn't happen. But David prophesied this was how the Messiah who was to come was to die. To Peter there says, No prophecy ever originated from humans. They didn't just sit around and say, let's look this one up and write it down. Instead, it says, that prophetic prophecy was given by the Holy Spirit as humans spoke under God's direction. Prophecy is God speaking to people and telling us what he wants to say to the situation that they're in right now and situations that were to come. So the Bible's prophetically accurate. My clicker's not working very well today. It's also thematically unified. Thematically unified. Well, what does that mean and why is that important? Because if you read any book, surely they have a theme about them, whether that's a detective novel or a sort of nature encyclopedia or something, they have a theme. But think about the Bible. It was written over thousands of years by well over 40 different people in at least three different languages in lots of different situations in prisons, on ships in caves, in palaces in everyday rooms, I guess written over 1600 years by over 40 different people in three languages or more but all with the same theme all with the same theme that is talking about God's redemption and salvation and his journey to know us, for us to know him and pointing us to Jesus. Luke 24 that I've got up there are words of Jesus where Jesus himself says, beginning with Moses and the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning him. That wasn't the New Testament, that was the Old Testament. Jesus himself saying, the whole of the Old Testament is pointing to me. That's the theme of God's word. It's me, the Messiah, the one who was to come. Jesus is central 
to the whole of scripture. That's the unifying theme. (coughs) The fifth way is that it's confirmed by Jesus. It's another reason why we know we can trust it. Because Jesus himself trusted it. People might say, well, okay, I've got a relationship with Jesus. I trust Jesus, but I don't know about these other guys. Paul and some of the things he said, people get a bit disturbed by sometimes, don't they? But Jesus trusted the Bible. And if I trust Jesus, don't I have to trust the rest of God's word to us? In Matthew 5, verse 18, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Jesus looks at the Bible, looks at what's written, looks at what God has already said. And he says, I trust it. And none of it's going to disappear, ever. And that's our next way we can trust it. The Bible has survived when people said it wouldn't survive. It's probably the most despised, the most derided, the most denied, the most disputed, the most dissected, the most debated, the most outlawed, the most destroyed book in the whole world. Yes, it survived. Because God has enabled it to survive. Voltaire, you may have heard of, famous 18th century philosopher. A brilliant man, but an atheist. He made this statement, if I've got it up. No, I haven't. Let me go back then. He said this. He said, 100 years from today, the Bible will be a forgotten book. In the 18th century, he said, 100 years from today, the Bible will be a forgotten book. You've probably forgotten his quote already, I would imagine. But I think God's got a sense of humor because after he died, for the next hundred years, the French Bible Society used his home to sell Bibles (laughs) for the next hundred years. The Bible will be a forgotten book in a hundred (laughs) years. It's nonsense. Isn't it? In fact, today we've probably got it more accessible than ever, haven't we? In our electronic devices as well as in our written form. Um, He was probably writing at a time when it was pretty inaccessible to many people. And today, for many, it is still inaccessible. In fact, to many, take North Korea, for example. Take a Bible into North Korea, you'll be arrested, imprisoned, probably killed, I would imagine. And many Christians are living under that situation today. And that's why it's great that we can help Ukraine and help them get Bibles that they would love to have. So it survived. The last one, point seven, is perhaps for me the most important. And that's that the Bible is transforming. And that's why I can trust it. Because it's transformed me And as I look around you this morning, I know for many of you, if not all of you, it's transformed you as you've read it, as you've come to see Jesus as the center of it. It's changed you and transformed you. It's got transforming power. I'm not a politician because I don't believe laws can change people's hearts. Only God can change people's hearts. He's the one who transforms us and changes. And in John 8, 31 to 32, he says, If you continue in my word, then you're my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Staying in his word, abiding in his word, understanding, learning, loving his word, it will transform you. It will continue to transform you. You may be able to pinpoint a day when you can look back on and say, I've changed that day. God changed me because I came to know him and I came to know Jesus. But I know in my life he's continued to transform me. And as we look to him and as we learn to love his word, he'll continue to transform you. But maybe you sat there thinking, well, actually the Bible isn't the foundation for my life. I can't accept it as the foundation for my life. I want to challenge you this morning. Because I want to say, it's not that you can't, it's just that you won't. 
accepted as a foundation for your life. And my question is, if that's not the authority, what is? Maybe you're the authority for your life. Maybe you want to say, well, I want to keep control. I want to, I want to be the one who d- makes the decisions in my life. And my question is, how is that going? If you're the foundation for your life, how is it going? Because I think God's word is the only solid foundation for life. And I want to encourage you to use that as the foundation for your life. I'm going to end with a prayer. I'm going to put it up on the screen. I'm going to read it. You might want to, in your mind, read it with me rather than out loud. If you can read it. It says, Dear God, from this day forward, I will accept the Bible as your flawless word to me. I will make it the final authority for my life. Not what television says, not what popularity says, not what I feel like doing or what I think sounds best. I'm going to make the final word the Bible as the authority for my life, even when I don't understand it, even when it's not popular, even when it's not easy, or even when I don't like it. You are God, and I'm not. Thank you, God, for loving me enough to speak to me through your word. Thank you that you spoke through about 40 men and women over 1,600 years on three continents in three languages to tell the one story, to tell me that you wanted me in your family and you wanted to know me. I want to love your word. I want to learn your word. And I want to live your word. Use these 40 days in my life to set me on the right path. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. So I hope you can see where we're going in the next 40 days. There's a couple of things you need to do. Number one, if you're not in a small group, you need to run to see Joe or you need to run to see me after the the service this morning. It's not too late to sign up. You can also go online to 40ditw.com and you can get a daily devotional for the next 40 days. If you want to do that, do that. That's www40 40ditw.com. Ask me after the service if you want to find out. You can sign up for a daily devotional. That will come in your email box or text, I think you can get it. And finally, we're going to use a verse each week as a sort of memory verse. They're not very long. This one's really short. It's from Colossians 3, verse 16. He says, maybe not. There we go. <laughs> Maybe we could read this together and we'll focus on it this week as we look at God's word together. Let's say it together. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. From Colossians 3, verse 16. Let's say it again. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. Colossians 3, verse 16. Amen. I think we'll end it since it's 5 to 11. Um, And we'll end it on those words rather than on the grace. Because that's my prayer for you this week. Amen.